The first fully developed documentary to attract the attention of the world was Nanook of the North, the actual life of an Eskimo family. This was a silent film made between 1920 and 1922 by Robert Flaherty, an Arctic explorer and engineer turned cinematographer and film editor. <laughs>
In 1929, the Soviet filmmaker Ziga Vertov made The Man with the Movie Camera, filmed not in a distant place, but in his own city, Moscow. This was also a silent film, though in the theater it was usually accompanied by live music.
In 1934, Joris Evans completed the New Earth, about the building of the dikes which hold back the Zuider Zee in Holland. A new technical resource had become available to the filmmaker, recorded sound edited to the film. In this case, narration, sound effects, and original music. Especially tough clay is required to build these dikes, and this clay is dredged up from the bottom of the Zuider Zee itself.
The area enclosed by the dike includes not only new land, but a kind of lake as well, which constantly collects water from higher ground and from rivers. At low tide, excess water drains from the lake through valves constructed at each end of the dike. In England, John Grierson saw the documentary as a way for the government to report to its citizens. Night Mail is about the mail train which runs between London and Glasgow. Place is over. Cover in the bags, see? Yeah. Then you be a cross trap up. It's all tight. Oh, it doesn't matter about them being tight. The main strap will tighten them up when she goes out. And then you put the other flaps over, seeing that there's bay straps in the centre of the pouch. Then you secure the pouch up, and it's all ready for dispatch. Go on, Paul, for you. Got that all right, Abby? Oh, I got that okay. Right, Abby, then. Seems easy, We'll soon get on with it. I'm sure about it. Get the car for it. Car for it? Yeah. One full pouch. Letters for Carnival. Letters all the way. That's a lot. Take it away, Sonny boy. Right, old handsome. That's the lot. All right, you get on with the big stuff.
lunch on Whitney's little pool in Huddersfield. About time. Where have you been? Give us a chance. We had seven parties here. Night mail crossing the border, bringing the check and the postal order. Letters for the rich, letters for the poor. The shop at the corner of the girl next door. Pulling up, B took a steady climb. The gradients against her, but she's on time. Cotton grass and moorland boulder, shoveling white steam over her shoulder, snorting noisily as she passes, silent miles of wind-bent grasses. Birds turn their heads as she approaches, stare from the bushes at her blank-faced coaches. Sheep dogs cannot turn her course, they slumber on with paws across. In the farm she passes, no one wakes, but a jug in a bedroom gently shakes. The climb is done. Down towards Glasgow she descends. Towards the steam tugs, yelping down the blade of cranes. Towards the fields of apparatus, the furnaces, set on the dark plain like gigantic chessmen. All Scotland waits for her. In the dark glens, beside the pale green sea lochs, Men long for news. Letters of thanks, letters from banks, letters of joy from the girl and the boy, receipted bills and invitations to inspect new stock or to visit relations and applications for situations and timid lovers, declarations and gossip, gossip from all the nations, new circumstantial news, financial letters with holiday snaps to enlarge in, letters with faces scrawled in the margin, letters from uncles, cousins and aunts, letters to Scotland from the south of France, letters of condolence to Highlands and Lowlands, notes from overseas to Hebrides, written on paper of every hue, the pink, the barnet, the white and the blue, the chatty, the catty, the boring, adoring, the cold and official, all the hearts are pouring, clever, stupid, short and long, the typed and the printed and spelt all wrong. Thousands are still asleep, dreaming of terrifying monsters, or a friendly tea beside the band at Cranston's or Crawford's. Asleep in working Glasgow, asleep in well-set Edinburgh, asleep in granite Aberdeen. They continue their dreams. But shall wake soon and long for letters, and none will hear the postman's knock without a quickening of the heart. For who can bear to feel himself forgotten? United States, 1937, the documentary as social comment. Long before ecology and environment became common concerns, Pierre Lorentz produced the river. Black spruce and Norway pine, Douglas fir and red cedar, Scarlet oak and shag bark hickory, hemlock and aspen. There was lumber in the north. The war impoverished the old south. The railroads killed the steamboats. But there was lumber in the north. Heads up, lumber on the upper river. Heads up, lumber enough to cover all Europe. Down from Minnesota and Wisconsin, down to St. Paul, down to St. Louis and St. Joe, lumber for the new continent of the West, lumber for the new mill.
lumber in the north, and coal in the hill. Iron and coal down the Monongahela. Iron and coal down the Ohio. Down to Pittsburgh, down to Wheeling. Iron and coal for the steel mill. For the railroads driving west and south. For the new cities of the Great Valley. new machinery and cleared new land in the west. Ten million bales down to the Gulf, cotton for the spools of England and France. Fifteen million bales down to the Gulf, cotton for the spools of Italy and Germany. Built a hundred cities and a thousand towns. St. Paul in Minneapolis, Davenport and Kyoko, Moline and Quincy, Cincinnati and St. Louis, Omaha and Kansas City. Across to the Rockies and down to Minnesota, 2,500 miles to New Orleans. We built a new continent. Black spruce and Norway pine, Douglas fir and red cedar, scarlet oak and shag bark hickory. We built a hundred cities and a thousand towns, but at what a cost? We cut the top off the Alleghenies and sent it down the river. We cut the top off Minnesota and sent it down the river. We cut the top off Wisconsin and sent it down the river. We left the mountains and the hills slashed and burned and moved on. Nineteen thirty nine. Willard Van Dyke, one of the cameramen on the river, and Ralph Steiner directed and photographed the city. the crowd. Get the big money. You make a pile and raise a pile. That makes another pile for you. Follow the crowd. We've reached a million, two million, five million. Watch us grow. Going up. It's new. It's automatic. It dictates, records, seals, sterilizes, stamps, and delivers in one operation without human hand. What am I bid? What am I offered? Sold. Who's next? The people. Yes. Follow the crowd to the Empire City, the Wonder City, the Windy City, the Fashion City. The people. Yes. The people. Perhaps.
yours. Most sincerely. We beg to remain yours most respectfully. Dear sir, we gentlemen wish to acknowledge having heard yours. Dear sir, yours from dear sir. Dear sir. Dear dear sir. Your order, your order. I wish to remain yours most respectfully.
Adolf Hitler appreciated the power of the documentary. He commissioned a talented young director, Lenny Riefenstahl, to make Triumph of the Will, and he put the resources of the Nazi state at her disposal.
In wartime England, too, the documentary was used to reinforce a people's sense of their own identity, as in Listen to Britain, directed by Humphrey Jennings during the German Blitz. This is London Calling. London Calling at the beginning of tonight's broadcasting in the African service. London is calling you in the 1945 on sea, land, or in the air, and in the merchant navy.
never going to roam again once I'm in the old hometown. By and by, I'll see my little home again. Then I'm going to settle down. Round the back of the army oh, Now the sun is on the floor. Where the black of the army chairs never seems to remember. That's where I used to be as happy as a mountain in
the Nazis documented almost everything with stills and movies. Combining this archival material with newly shot color scenes, with words and with music, Alain René made Night and Fog. The collaborators who served as guards in this camp had their own prostitutes, prisoners like the others. But while they lived, better fed, even able once in a while to save a piece of bread for a friend, the SS had managed to set up an entire community, residential area, hospital, and all sorts of special facilities. Yes, even a prison. It's useless to try to describe what went on here. Women, men, in cells built to order so they couldn't stand up or lie down, day after day, night after night. The ventilators were penetrated by their screams. 1942. Himmler arrives. The time for annihilation has come, but annihilation which is productive. Leaving the problem of productivity to his technicians, Himmler concentrates on annihilation. Plans are drawn up. Models are constructed. The prisoners themselves help construct the building a crematorium. Someday, it will seem like a picture postcard. Tourists will want to be photographed here. More and more people are deported all over Europe. Convoys start, stop, start up again, are bombed, finally arrive. For some, the choice has already been made. For the others, it will follow swiftly. Those on the left will work, those on the right. These pictures were taken a few minutes before extermination. Killed by hand would take time. So poison gas is provided. Nothing distinguishes the gas chamber from the other buildings. Inside, a false shower room in which they assemble the newcomers. They shut the doors and they observe. The only signs, but you wouldn't know if you hadn't been told, are the fingernail scratches on the ceiling, so that even the concrete began to crumble. When the crematorium became inadequate, they burned bodies on the ground. New ovens, however, absorbed thousands of bodies a day.
the end of World War II, survivors go back to their homes. The return was made by a group of French and American POWs, including Henri Cartier-Bresson, himself a German prisoner of war. The army of repatriation, the French with their joyous air, the English as though on parade at Buckingham Palace, the Belgians marching by threes for the last time. They approach the big C-47 transport planes, giant airborne trolley cars. Each flight carries 26 liberated men. 99,000 Frenchmen return this way in a month. On one day alone, 10,900 land in Paris. Between the 10th and 20th of May, 73,000 depart from Germany at an altitude of 6,000 feet on their way home. There are times in life when too many things happen at once. Your first flight in an airplane, and that very flight, a flight to freedom. It's a lot. There are moments these men will always remember. They'll remember when the pilot sent back the note saying, we're over France, and then brought the aircraft closer to the ground. One fellow was a roofer. Ah, French roofs, he said when he saw the tiles of the housetops. They saw the patterned fields and the farmyards, the cars and the road signs. And they knew that this was their country and their home. And that the first steps they took would be on French ground. Deportés, these prisoners, disembark at Le Bourget Airport. In post-war United States, documentary filmmakers turned again to social problems. The Quiet One, directed by Sidney Myers, comes close in its enacted scenes to the dramatic feature. But it still has the feel as well as the unrehearsed street action of the documentary.
smells like home, but it's no home for you. Are you coming back in here or not? What'd you say it for? Shh. Not so loud. Don't shush me. You can't even talk in your own place. What'd you say it for, then? I didn't mean it like you took it. What'd you say it for, then? I didn't say it like you took it for. Like I took it for. All I know is you said it. Say a thing like that, I think I'd take it. Just sit and swallow it. That it? Want that? Because if that's what you're looking for, you better look someplace else. Nobody asked you to swallow nothing. Don't give me that stuff. Wasn't trying to give you no stuff. What you call it? Don't call it nothing. You tell me every time I say... Now, what's the matter? Leave the baby alone. Let him mind her. And you and me will go out. Doggone it, woman, where's my necktie? Get me a rock, I'll force them big mouth. Sit here with Arlene. Have you got something to give the kids?
shut up! Donald came to Wiltwick. These were the things which made him what he was. Months after he saw the last of his people, he was still paralyzed by his memories. There wasn't much we could do for him until he made some move himself. Television and cinema verite changed documentary technique. Newly available equipment now made it easy to shoot dialogue on location. Sit-in, seen in a million American homes, was made for NBC by Al Wasserman and Bob Young in 1961. The impulse that led to the sit-in movement had been growing for some time, and it was the Negro College students in Nashville and in other cities who would bring it into action. The background of these students was a religious one, and in addition, many of them had been inspired by the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, as applied by the Reverend Martin Luther King. A few of the students had prepared to put theory into practice by attending workshops, in which they rehearsed for the ordeal they would have to undergo when they began sitting in at white lunch counters. When an idea um, is something I've never heard of, I like to explore and see what it really is. So I went to this workshop, and on this particular night, they were having some role playing. And in some of the scenes, you almost cried because they would have someone playing the part of. sort of comments. They touch to your soul and they make you realize that it's all the more important that you do something about it. February 13th was our first sit-in in Nashville. On this sit-in we had about 130 kids. I think on this day many of us didn't realize just how important our movement would grow to be. The targets of the Nashville students were the lunch counters of the city's two largest department stores and four variety stores. 
And for the first time, the community was confronted with Negroes in places where they had never been. You go to a counter. You do not, you do not request that the person sitting next to you get up and leave. You merely come in and sit down beside him, as any human being would do. You cause no violence. You have no angry words. You're friendly. And it sort of helps to project the idea that here sits beside me another human being. Altogether, it was a moving feeling within me that I was sitting there demanding a God-given right. And my soul became satisfied that I was right in what I was doing. At the same time, with something deep down within me, moving me, that I could no longer be satisfied or go along with an evil system, that I had to be maladjusted to it. And in spite of all of this, I had to keep loving the people who denied me service, who stared at me. During the early weeks of February 1960, the demonstrations that came to be called the sit-in movement exploded across the South. Within a period of two months, the movement had spread to 65 cities involving every southern state with the exception of Mississippi. The new tactic came as a surprise, creating bewilderment and confusion in the white communities and even among the Negroes themselves. During the weeks after the sit-ins began, opposition in the white communities of the South solidified and the first signs of violence appeared. Those few whites who sympathized publicly with the sit-ins soon found themselves to be prime targets. One of these was a young divinity student in Nashville, Wilson Yates. Well, I was downtown with a friend around Memorial Square. I'd actually gone back to put a nickel in the meter. My car happened to be parked by Memorial Square where the picketing was going on. And suddenly, we moved into a different world. There were the crowds shouting, niggers go home, and then there were the Negro students who were carrying posters asking for equal opportunity. And being thrown in the situation of the crisis, I had to act, and I had no other choice than to respond as I did. So I walked over and I asked the Negroes if it would help or harm if I carried a poster. They said it would help. Right before I went over, some white boys had entered the ring carrying derogatory posters like Go Home Coon and Send the Bunnies Home. And I entered the, I entered the ring and I started walking around. I was with a friend. One of the white boys walked over to this friend. He said something to him. I told him when he come around on the white side, I just going to hit him one time. Here I was in the raw walking around a square carrying a poster which said equal rights for all and the crowds on each side yelling get rid of the nigger lover tell the nigger lover to go home and they were referring to me the boy came towards me he cursed me out yeah because he was white taken up for the nigger i that really got me a lot when them two white boys started carrying signs for the niggers over there. And then the momentum began to build from the crowd, and they said, hit the nigger lover, hit the nigger lover. And then there's that strange, long, lonely feeling where you're waiting for something to happen, and you don't know what's going to happen, but somehow, down deep, you're ready for it. And he walked up behind me. I reached and grabbed that yank boy to see how hard I could hit it. He hit me in the back of the neck. I lurched forward, but I didn't, I didn't fall. I regained my balance, and then, and then in the midst of it, with, with the shouting and the jeering and the crowd of people, I suddenly felt this, this tremendous humiliation. Suddenly, I, I had crossed into another race. I had moved into a different world. I was, I was a Negro feeling all of the rejection and humiliation he must have to go through every time he's rejected. On the morning of the 27th, this was to be our first real violent day. It was the first time when we could really test our own convictions as far as nonviolent means were concerned. Five ministers said to us, if you go downtown today, you're going to be arrested. Please don't go downtown. 
because we're not prepared, we should have community behind us. Paul Pratt, he was one of the few white students who were with us. They always pick on the white students because they hate to see white sympathizers. I saw a bunch of colored sitting on the stools. They look like a bunch of idiots sitting up there waiting for people to try to throw them off, and they look like they were just trying to egg on a fight. None of us looked back, but yet we could see everything that was going on through the long mirror. And it seems to me that when it happened, that all of us wanted to be hit. This was an experience that we needed to keep our movement going to keep ourselves going and to convince ourselves that we really were non-bound. On February 27th, which was on Saturday afternoon, I was cruising down Fifth Avenue. One of McClellan's, a man came out and said that there was a fight on the inside. There had been a disturbance, but there was a bunch of colored boys and girls on the stools and the counters, and the management uh, asked that they leave, and I instructed him to ask them to leave, and they did not leave. I went and asked each and every one of them separately to leave. They didn't leave, so I instructed the men to uh, put them, place them under arrest. We placed them under arrest. The police, when they gave me an alternative, they said, son, you can sit here on the stool and act a fool, or you can get up and go home. And I made my choice. I decided that I would keep my seat. And they told me I was under arrest, and then they took me away. Uh, when we cleared the stools, uh, why, some more colored boys and girls and white boys and girls got uh, on the seats. When, when we told them that they were under arrest and they had to leave, while well, they got up. But as far as having anything personal against them or anything against them because they were either black or white. Uh, we arrested in this crowd uh, uh, several white boys and girls. Uh, it was just a case where we had to uh, uh, clean this man's store out, and we did it. I'm C.E. Warren, the turnkey at City Jail. I've never seen anything like when they brought these kids in. On February 27th, 80 Nashville students were arrested out of over 300 who were participating in the sit-ins that day, the first of a series of wholesale arrests throughout the South. Man, what my mother's going to say when she hear about that? The mother of two students who were in jail. Well, there was plenty of anxiety on my part. But I always think of uh, what Matthew Jr. told me. And when he called, <laughs> when he called from the jail, he said, <laughs> he said, be cool, mother. <laughs> and that was very uh, trying, and yet it was amusing, too. <laughs> He's telling me to be cool at this point. <laughs> so, even now, when I think of it, I get quite a bit of uh, fun out of it. Just hear him say it. I can't say it as he said it. But he said, be cool, mother. <laughs> and I tried to be cool. <laughs> so um, I felt, though, that, that there would be safety for them because I felt that our faith in God would help them to bring them through this safely. The handheld sound camera trademark of the new style of documentary. Ricky Leacock was the principal director cameraman on Primary, about the contest for the U.S. presidential nomination in Wisconsin. cigarettes 
or cigars for the next 20 minutes. The uh, senator is ready to arrive in, I'd say, a minute and a half or so. And there has been some complaint uh, by the women that one of their dresses has been burned by a man smoking a cigar in back of her. So if you'll just please. We'd appreciate This is the heart of Senator Kennedy's strength. The heavily populated city areas, particularly the Polish Catholic 4th District in Milwaukee. Who hasn't decided how they're going to vote. 
and I must say it is going to be a decisive campaign. I've said on many occasions that I didn't think it was possible to be nominated if I were unsuccessful here in Wisconsin, and I must say I mean it. Clem Zablocki and I sponsor a bill together, the Zablocki Kennedy Bill, as he calls it, the Kennedy Zablocki Bill, as I sometimes refer to it. But that bill, which you may not have ever heard about, provides that the Battle Act shall be amended, and it shall be possible for surplus foods and surplus things that we have in this country to be made available to the people behind the Iron Curtain. And I believe Poland. We would have passed that bill two years ago. We would have passed that bill two years ago. But it failed by one vote in the Senate when the President withdrew his support on the day the bill was coming up to vote. That's how important the office of the presidency is. He shall determine what shall be our policy on Berlin. He shall determine whether we shall be at war or peace. This is the key office. And I run for the presidency because, like you, I have strong ideas about what this country must do. I have strong ideas about the United States playing a great role in a historic moment. When the cause of freedom is endangered all over the world, when the United States stands as the only sentry at the gate, when we can see the campfires of the enemy burning on distant hills. That's what's at issue today. That's what we are attempting to determine. In the coming months and years, all of us as Americans are going to be called out of the ranks. Our courage is going to be tested. And I am confident that we are going to give the same affirmative answer. That's what I think this election is about. That's what we're going to begin to do on next Tuesday. Thank you. Furnaces by Argentinian filmmaker Fernando Solanas, a four-hour interpretation of national history and a call for radical action. The documentary as political education.
people are denied all political power. Neocolonialism can commit its crimes with impunity. The system defines legality in its own terms. It is a dispenser, an administrator of violence. The system itself becomes violence. Violence attacks. It penetrates the homes and the minds of men. If a man resists, he is struck down and destroyed. Fallen, he is no longer a man. The violence of the system is meant to suppress, to terrorize, to silence. It makes a man a passive thing who does not shape his own life but submits to it like an object. The violence of the system works not so much by repression as by the fear it instills. The fear that every man has of being persecuted and excluded. The fear of doing the very things that would restore his humanity. A comrade has said, the question of violence must be approached in a spirit of sincerity and truth. It is sheer hypocrisy to focus only on the violence of the oppressed. Those who exploit other men must surely hate them. Against the devastating force of this hatred, there is only one force which can be opposed, the force of love. The violent love of our fighters. A sublime expression of their love of truth.
Prepárate, prepara tu ciel, prepara tu cuerpo para resistir. Será una guerra larga, será una guerra cruel, será tu nueva vida, tu amor y tu deber. Será nuestra esperanza, será nuestra unidad, se hará nacer la patria y nuestra humanidad. Golpea y ataca sin interrupción, con odio, con odio y organización. Violencia. Con y organización, violencia, con organización, con odio y organización, violencia, para romper el orden, violencia, para cortar al hombre, al enemigo, quítale su paz. To make Harlan County, USA, Barbara Koppel lived for many months with the miners she was filming. She and her crew have a direct personal connection with the events and at times even become part of the action. United Mine Works today is a labor organization of rank and file miners, led by rank and file miners for rank and file miners, and that's the way it ought to be. I want to introduce to all of you now, and I expect that most of you already know, Miss Florence Reese. I'm not a coal miner, as you well know, but I'm as close as I could be not to be one. My father was a coal miner, he was killed in the mines, and my husband is slowly dying with black lung. And my husband and me was in the strike in the 30s in bloody Harlan County, and I do mean it is bloody, too. And they tell me, these miners say, we're gonna stick it out unless Duke Power signs a contract till hell freezes over. <laughs> nothing to lose but their chains and their union to gain. So I say, hang in there. And I, now this song I composed in the 30s. And as you know, I'm old, that's 40 years ago, and I can't sing very well. But you, you can ask the scabs and the gun thugs which side they're on, because they're workers too. Come all you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell. How the good old union has come in here to dwell. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? If you go to Harlan County, there is no neutral there. You'll either be a union man or a thug for D.H. Blair. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? What about, what about this gun being pulled? Oh, he pulled it right here. He pulled it. 
Sorry. He had it concealed in a rag. He told me that he'd blow us if we got in his way again, he would, he, he, he would mow us down. I told him, I said, I'll see you in federal court Monday if you say that again, sir. We're here on peaceful business. And so he put it back in his holster then, wrapped it back up in a rag and got back in his car. But he did pull the gun and point it. That face of car is that the gun thug. He is a known strike breaker. Uh, that man is the gun thug. He's the same one that came up here before. And, uh, and he had the gun in the car whenever uh, Reb was talking to him. And he's a cruising around here now, going up and down, trying to find out who's here, you see. Who are you working with, honey? What? Who do you United work with? Trust. Will you show me your press card? Show me your press card. Okay. What's your name, sir? My name is Basil Collins. Do you work here? Yes, ma'am. What's your position here? My informant. How do you feel about the people picketing out here? Well, I don't have no comment on that. And you, sir? Same thing. Where's this press card you was going to show me? Can I see your identification? Ma'am? May I see your identification? Yes, ma'am. If I had him, I'll swear I've lost it. All I do is just say Oh, I think I might have misplaced mine, too. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, he had the nerve enough, believe it or not, to run for sheriff. This morning was the first time they, they went to war. All of them had guns and pistols. And it was just, you know, it was really bad, I find. Not happy about it. We can't hold them. We could hold them, but we can't hold them with all them guns they got. They got guns. We don't got them. They allowed to carry guns and sticks. We can't have nothing but a knife and a whip rock. That's right. Come on. Yeah. Hey, it's got safety. Hey, it's got and if it did, it wouldn't shoot nothing. Yeah, I might do that one anyway. <laughs> as long as we got enough. I want you to move the needle over. Oh, tell them I started out with a switch on that picket line, but I'm ended up now carrying a gun. I mean, all the time, too. Hell, you, I just, you know, especially been, since what's happening up there at High Snap, and knowing them and seeing them, seeing a machine gun, no. Time to. Well, you'd be crazy not to carry a gun now. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, I'll be going up. Are y'all going to be back at six?
me, let's, let's break it up now. Burn the bridge, let these people live. You know that nigger? That nigger is a better man than you'll ever be. He's a better man than you'll ever be. Three or four uh, damn old gun thugs get on him and start kicking a woman and hitting a woman, and then, then a, 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 another one come over and, and start beating a man and, and getting four or five of them on him, and then see a, a Basil Collins holding a gun and, and calling a, 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 one of a union man that believes in these union men, saying, I want you to get that nigger. You hear that nigger? Get that nigger. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. And it's, it's time for us. Uh, to, to stand together and, 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 and get just as violent as they are. Right. They're violent, so by God, you fight far with far. It seemed like they were pretty well organized to me this morning. And we're going to have to get a little tighter organized. We're going to get together, the women are going to get together and be responsible for 10 women each, or 10 people okay. up there each at 4 o'clock. If you women going to bring 10 each, then uh, the men ought to be able to say, well, we'll bring five, or we'll bring 10, or we'll bring 15. And that would be working together. You're gonna have to get some more black people out too, because you look odd if <laughs> <laughs> I am odd. They want us to sit by and watch them shoot, and not us to shoot back. And the police is not gonna do nothing about it, do they? No, we know that. Just fight back, just attack hell out of them, and not run. Let your conscience be your glad. I never run. I, I had one. One's all I could handle. But I got him. He, he didn't come no farther. And if there's enough of us up there, and we can get one, if each one of us can get one, hell, we can do it. Men, women, and children, all. It's time to stand up and be counted. <laughs> Don't you gonna be thrown back for 500 years? 